So welcome everybody to this seventh webinar of the Discover Us project. And I would like to remind everybody that we are recording uh, this talk and uh, will be later published uh, in our website. So today I'm uh, happy to host uh, Hadi Esmail Zade from University of California in San Diego. Uh, Hadi is a full professor uh, on uh, chairing uh, the high glue, high glue, <laughs> sorry, high glue, glue, uh, chair on the computer architect as comp on a, on a computer architecture position. Okay, as he's also a founding director of the Alternative Computing Technologies Lab, where his team is developing new technologies and cross stack solutions to enable responsible immersive intelligence. And I guess this is what uh, is he going to talk us about today, since the title uh, title of his talk is Cross Domain Multi Acceleration, Powering Massive uh, Intelligence from Edge to Cloud. I think whenever you want, you can start. Thank you so much, Rosa, for uh, the introduction, and I thank you and uh, IP and uh, Discover Us Transatlantic Initiative for hosting the talk. You guys can hear my voice, uh, you know, properly. I'm just going to use my professor voice. Hopefully that's, uh, you know, coming across properly. Let me just jump into it. So today I'm going to take you guys into a journey, which starts with, you know, taking a little bit of the transistors and we're going to, uh, we're going to talk about how uh, I am actually trying to evangelize a new concept, which I refer to it as cross-domain multi-acceleration. So, Without further ado, let's jump into it. I'm going to start like, you know, I usually start with my talks with this question that what is the difference between the computing in the industry and the uh, toothpaste industry? And uh, uh, I'm not sure if like, you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, let people to open their mics and answer, but I'll just move forward with this question as that one of the major differences that we have with other commodity industries like toothpaste or you know whatever you can uh, you, you you imagine is that our economic model that we offer our um, uh, you know services and devices not just about the hardware is based on offering new capabilities you don't buy a new software because you run out of that software you know we're moving to our subscription models, but usually that's not what, uh, you know, you go after. What you, uh, you know, buy a software based on is that it's offering new capabilities. And we have been, uh, you know, we have been on this trajectory of economical advance that is driving the entire ID, IT industry and is holding the entire, uh, you know, I mean, right now IT is so prevalent in everything that kind of, is the backbone of the uh, socioeconomical advances that we are making. That's one of the differences. The other difference is that actually, unlike other commodity industries, as computing have become uh, a commodity, the price of uh, raw material for computing has been actually dropping over the years exponentially. While the Usually the, you know, the base material for different commodities, actually the price of which is actually increasing. I think I did some calculations and in 1971, which is the year the first microprocessors came out, Japanese and Intel did, I think Japanese, uh, you know, kind of beat Intel to it. Uh, so the price of like one MIPS million instruction per second was $5,000. And this is considering some inflation, and then it's now fewer than cents. And the re the reason for that is Moore's law. Why? Because we have been able to double the number of transistors that we have been integrating onto the chips every eighteen months. Uh, you know, uh, more precisely, but just doubling the no number of transistors on a chip on its own doesn't do much. So that's when we as computer architects, and I, you know, I bear the, uh, you know, honor to be a computer architect, we come in and we harvest this, uh, you know, extra added integration capacity and build general purpose processors that make these uh, transistors available to masses. I want to 
emphasize the programmability aspect of general purpose processors because we are so used to offering these uh, uh, you know, devices that nobody actually thinks about these transistors. Nobody actually thinks that like, you know, billions of transistors are literally switching in my laptop right now for you and in your laptop to, for you to be able to um, hear what I'm saying uh, at this point. There is communication advances that we have made, which is, uh, you know, additional, uh, you know, it is a different, in, uh, you know, aspect of the ID industry, but that generalness, general purposeness of the processor that we are doing is very integral to what we, uh, you know, what we offer. And not only we make these transistors available to the masses, but also we exponentially increase, at least we used to increase the performance of these devices. And by, by virtue of that, we are actually reducing the uh, you know, the, the cost for computing. Actually, if you think about, and this has been now more, uh, you know, discussed in the community, Moore's Law is not actually about the doubling of the transistors. It's more about re exponentially reducing the cost per transistor, which is not going down because the force behind Moore's Law, Moore's Law is just a prediction that, you know, came true. Uh, but the technology that, or, uh, you know, just powered it is the dinar the scaling uh, based on which you can take a transistor and you can do a, um, you know, a, um, uh, which is a, you know, you, 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 you can scale its area capacitance and frequency in such a way that its area is going down and its power is going proportionally down and becoming half every generation. But do not the scaling broke in the middle of mid two uh, thousands, and but what happened then is that now we're getting transistors that we're not able to, uh, you know, power them on, and that is what, uh, you know, what we refer to as dark silicon. So you're increasing the integration capacity of the the chip, but you have to keep some of these transistors powered down because of the power density issues that you're running into. And that's because the physical properties of the transistors that we are, uh, you know, we're scaling down, it's, it's not happening the same way it used to be happening traditionally. So if we look at the history, when we started in 1971, Moore's Law, sword and we were able to increase the integration capacity and what we did we started integrating for instance caches were off chip now caches are on chip we built uh you know uh branch predictors integrated them into the uh, you know into the same chip we started increasing the uh, the number of instructions that we uh you know we were issuing in parallel there was the golden age of ilp and at the same time, we were, you know, exponentially increasing the, you know, the frequency. We went from 740 uh, kilohertz to 3.4 gigahertz. And the, 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 the predictions, if you actually look at the press releases from Intel at the time, it was that we're going to have like, you know, 10 gigahertz uh, processors. We never reached that. And that's exactly what happened, right? And then that is when the industry that builds these general purpose processes actually switched its attention from single threat performance scaling to multi-thread performance scaling. And the promise was that if I can use these instructions and just copy paste my cores, I'm just gonna give you more performance and more performance. But unfortunately, that didn't pan out as well. But at the time that we wrote our dark silicon paper, which was, published in ISCA 2011, and it's one of the ISCA 50, uh, you know, retrospectives in the last uh, 25 years, the, I, I think around 70 to 80% of the papers in ISCA the same year was on multi-cores. And even they were like kilo-core, multi-core papers being re researched. But what we did is that we did actually a kind of a futuristic projection into how much performance scaling are we, are we going to get from the you know multi cores and we assumed parallel uh, benchmarks and you're seeing the results here you on the x axis you're looking at 
10 year of, uh, you know, development. This has been done in 2011. So this is looking into the future. The, 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 the Y axis used perform performance improvement over 45 nanometer, which was the technology at the time that I was doing this study. The blue line is the 18X improvement that we got in 10 years when we were in the you know golden era of ILP. And the expectation was that we either need to match it or surpass it. And we used two different uh, you know, projections, one based on it was more optimistic and it was based on ITRS. And for people who remember ITRS, it's no longer around. It was a consortium that set, uh, you know, goals and ambitions for the semiconductor industry and became irrelevant uh, because its prediction was not holding up anymore. And another one based on the conservative transit scaling, scaling that we, we got based on uh, some data that Shekhar Bokar, who is an Intel fellow, uh, uh, you know, actually uh, presented. And what is going on is that not only we're not matching the performance benefits that we used to get from general purpose processors, we're actually severely under delivering performance. And in the bottom row, you can say that we, when we get to eight nanometers, actually half of the transistors are not going to be turned on. It doesn't mean that I'm saying we're going to build transistors are not going to, uh, you know, are not. I'm just going to keep them turning them off. It means that I'm not going to be able to lower the cost per transistor that we are seeing today. So this paper actually was profiled on the, you know, uh, on the New York Times. And I think it's one of the most highly cited papers from ISCA, generally speaking. It's, uh, and I think it was one of the, I mean, the, uh, you know, I think the best way was like, you know, one of those knocks on the door that caused the shift towards domain specific accelerators because we realized that we cannot hold up the same trend that we were uh, you know holding up that we're just gonna increase the performance under the you know uh, under the abstraction of instruction set architectures and the software is not gonna be aware of the hardware and hardware doesn't care what kind of software it's running we just know the isa and that's done and uh, so and this kind of look at that, if you look at the timelines, to, we published this in 2011 and in two, uh, 2012, AlexNet came out. So it was a little bit of a lucky coincidence that the new upheaval from neural network coincided with our study that showed, you know, the, the performance scaling that we, we expect to get, uh, you know, from uh, transistors not holding up and now there is a workload that actually really, really needs, uh, you know, performance beyond what we, uh, you know, what we can offer. So in the 2012, I actually published a paper that the paper coined the term neural processing unit. So I bear that honor as well. But the paper... And we had a lot of trouble actually publishing this paper because every, every, nobody wanted to publish any neural network papers. But the idea wasn't accelerating the next generation of the neural networks. When I wrote the paper and I came up with the idea, which was around, I think, uh, it was 2011 that I came up with the idea. Yes, AlexNet wasn't even out yet. The idea was that, well, one of the ways that we may be able to, you know, continue performance scaling is by hardware software specialization and being able to use some property of the applications that you can actually compromise a little bit of the, uh, you know, accuracy of the computation to gain, uh, you know, disproportionate performance and power efficiency, uh, you know, from that specialization. And the idea that I came up with that, well, neural networks are known to be world-class, uh, you know, function approximated. How about I take regions of code and, uh, you know, regions of code, learn it with a neural network, and then replace that region of code with a neural network access, which is tightly coupled with the CPU. This is kind of cool, you know, in the era that we're looking at tightly coupled accelerators, like GPUs or even TPU or the other NPUs that we see right now are loosely coupled accelerators that we see. We, this was, uh, you know, an attempt to integrate them within. And then what we are doing is that we are actually injecting structure parallelism in a single thread performance and harvesting it. Uh, uh, through a neural network transformation, this is an algorithmic transformation that 
because neural networks, even the previous generation, and these are shallow neural networks, I'm just learning regions of code here, uh, they're hardly parallel and you can actually implement them with digital and analog. And the reason that I actually came up with the idea is that I had this ambition and dream for many years that I wanted to be able to run imperative code like Python and C on analog hardware, which we actually later on published. And that paper is also one of the ISCA, uh, you know, um, I think we published it in ISCA 2014. Yeah, it's one of the ISCA 50 uh, retrospectives as well. And the, uh, the the whole idea is that I'm taking diverse code and I'm, uh, you know, I am mapping regions of that, not all of it is very important, to a common representation, which is a neural network, uh, neural representation, and then you perform the, the acceleration, right? So the term NPU actually came out of a different view of performance scaling, not necessarily for because like, you know, neural networks were actually. I have to tell you guys that I have a long history of accelerating neural network besides this work. I actually, in my undergrad project in University of Tehran, which I won some award for, it was uh, on hardware acceleration, conic section function neural networks, which I don't think any of you guys have heard of it, uh, but it uh, uses conic section functions as activation. It can give you both closed boundary and open boundary classifiers out of this. So from undergrad, I was working on hardware support for neural uh, networks, and I was very frustrated, uh, you know, with the literature at the time for it, because we really was just take you know neural network and implement it on an FPGA build the chip out of it which wasn't general it wasn't usable there was usability issues besides the the fact that well neural network wasn't very delivery but before I try and kind of jump into the uh, you know neural network acceleration I want to just show a result of what we did in terms of the algorithmic uh, you know transformation this is a an application Sobol filter which is used for edge detection and uh, and one of the images is generated by the original code that was written in Python. This is actually the first uh, you know, application that I implemented. And the second one is generated by one of the kernels of the Sobel filter being replaced by a neural network. And I usually ask, can you guess which one is with the original program and the other one is with the approximate program? And uh, this is not as interactive as I would have liked, but the question is not which one is which. The question is that, does it even matter, right? Well, we have moved on a little bit, you know, from approximate company. It was a hot area for a while, but we moved on. And what happened is that again in 2012, uh, uh, you know, 12, uh, Jeff hinted, research group actually came up with Alex that they showed unprecedented, uh, you know, performance with neural networks, and then that started an explosion in research in neural networks. So I have to kind of, this is a funny, ironic fact that the uh, NeurIPS, uh, you know, conference at the time wasn't, you know, they were debating whether or not they should accept two neural networks or papers or one was enough. Uh, and uh, most of the research in machine learning was on kernel methods, which is uh, support vector machines. And I remember talking to some machine learning faculty in Georgia Tech when I was a professor there, that they were, um, you know, they were telling me that, why would you even do neural network? And this is an exponential graph that shows the, you know, the compute needs for training these neural networks. And the lines are exponential, you know, exponents. And the the the, dark, the gray line is Moore's law. And the red line is actually, uh, you know, shows that we actually significantly, we not only general purpose processes do not match. We talked about that, the Moore's law traditionally. But now we're looking at something that is requires computation beyond that. So let's jump into now neural acceleration from the deep learning, you know, perspective. And I'm going to take you guys a journey through, you know, the continuum of what we have worked on from the, you know, edge side to the cloud side in this realm, right? So uh, one of the works that this one is also part of the, you know, ISCA 50, uh, you know, retrospective in the last uh, 25 Years, I, I really like this. I, you know, this um, this paper is one of my, uh, you know, favorite ideas. Is that I wanted to deliver uh, the performance of high, uh, you know, high performance GPUs in the milliwatt regime for edge embedded devices. And one of my students that was actually interning in ARM, so I came up with this idea. 
and uh, and at the time people were talking about like binary neural networks, which I'm not sure if that you know it became a thing, uh, you know, in general. But we didn't want to actually compromise, and they were compromising on the accuracy. But we weren't. We didn't want to compromise on the accuracy because, it, you know, a binary neural network at the time would take like 14% hit in the, you know, accuracy. That's like, I don't know, 10 years in, uh, you know, neural network research. So I wasn't, you know, up for that coming from approximate computing. That's a little bit ironic. Uh, but then there was a parallel research that was happening in the machine learning community that said, actually, if you do mixed precision quantization, that now has become a thing, especially for LLMs, and this was done in the you know, vision community at the at the time, then you can maintain the, you know, the accuracy. But the, the mixed precision means that I don't have a fixed, uh, you know, precision in the hardware that I can support. I can't just go two bits. I have to support dynamic, uh, you know, precision adjustments at the bit level in my architecture. And that's what we we support it. We actually said, what we'll do is that we're going to design a fusion unit, which is a composition of smaller units, which we call it bit bricks. These bit bricks are two bit by two bit, uh, you know, multipliers. But there is a glue logic, which is a combination of glue logic. And then if your layers are two bit by two bit, then this physical unit of a collection of two bit by two bit multipliers uh, will give you 16, uh, you know, 16 uh, parallel uh, two bit by two bit multipliers. If your inputs are two bit by eight bit multipliers, dynamically at runtime, I think it takes just one cycle, doesn't take much, you know, much. They will reorganize themselves and they will pose logically as four two by eight bit multipliers, or if you need even eight bit by eight bit multiplication, I'll compose all of them logically and give you, uh, you know, uh, one eight bit by eight bit multiplication. So what I'm doing is that in the ar architecture, I'm actually providing this bit fusion capability that dynamically with low runtime overhead matches the bit width of the DNL layers. We did the same logical uh, you know, reconfiguration at the runtime and the physical, uh, you know, buffers that we had, and the buffers can become thin and tall or widen, uh, you know, uh, 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 fat, uh, depending on the requirements of the layers. And what that gives us is that I can actually kind of match, I'm like 18% lower than Titan XP, which runs at 250 watt in less than eight, uh, you know, less than one watt of power consumption. And the reason is that, well, we, the, the, the Titan XP is, is actually using Tensor RT into eight, you know, execution model is not that we're doing magic. The reason is that we are actually optimizing computation, storage, and off-chip memory transfer at the finest granularity possible bits, right? So we actually take took this idea further. We actually have designed something that, you know, uses bit partitioning, but in across a vector and uses switch capacitance, uh, you know, circuits to build, uh, uh, you know, to actually build analog, uh, you know, multiplications, uh, sorry, mo uh, uh, analog NPUs, mixed signal, you know, in NPUs. Well, we get some benefits, but I haven't seen results, including ourselves, that actually justifies move towards the, you know, analog, but we have done that. So this is the edge side that you can actually, by looking at algorithmic properties of the neural networks and leveraging what is happening over there, you can actually deliver extreme ultra, you know, efficiency. But that's not the, the whole story. You have a cloud, you have a cloud, not cloud, so you have a, cl a cloud that actually is subsuming a lot of the services. And we, now we are seeing a lot of the, uh, you know, services, intelligent services are actually hosted on the cloud. But what is the issue? The issue is that the predictions, and this is coming from um, McKinsey and Co., is that we're going to actually increase until 2020. Uh, you know, five, this is a prediction between like 2017 and 2000, uh, 2025, so which we're almost there, right? That we're going to double the, you know, the market on the cloud and we're going to increase the edge market by 50x. And that's both around, you know, $5 billion market. 
in terms of the utilization of accelerators. But the problem is that we're not actually utilizing these accelerators. Actually, at the time that we went into studying multi-tenancy in DNA acceleration in the cloud, there was an arm race to building the most efficient, the fastest, uh, you know, neural accelerator on the, you know, on the planet. But the question was that, are they being completely utilized or not? If we actually look at the history again in terms of multi-tenancy, so first GPU came out in 1999, uh, 2021, you know, we have GP GPUs. Then we have around 2012, 20, 2009 that you have temporal multi-tenancy. That means that you can swap in and out applications across one GPU, but you're not co-locating them simultaneously. And in 2012, that was the the, you know, the first time that uh, you know research came out on spatial multi-tenancy that you you know co-locate to um, uh, accelerated. In 2014 is the now published, which is a one of the seminal works that actually sparked the more research into uh, NPUs for DNNs. Um, this is this is Olivier Tamem actually from India, uh, who led this with uh, his uh, collaborators from China, and uh, it's we're looking at almost uh, you know six years after that the first multi-tenant DNN accelerator came out, uh, Prema from Korea, uh, KAIST actually. Um, and then at the same day, we actually published a spatial multi-tenancy. And what do I mean by spatial multi-tenancy? We actually, what, what I mean is that we want to co-locate multiple neural network, uh, you know, workloads in the cloud NPU simultaneously. And for doing that, we actually introduced this concept of dynamic architecture fission, which means that if you take a physical accelerator, you should be able to break it down to multiple full-fledged logical accelerators that can serve different workloads. And that is the, the paper we published in Micro 2012. It requires redesigning the memory organization and the systolic units. Actually, we had collaborators uh, you know, from Google who confirmed that the underutilization problem exists. Um, I was very grateful that you know Norm Jupi was aware of our design and uh, um, and the, the design that we have done. And I don't have time to get into the details of it. Is actually changes the structure, internal structure of systolic uh, units. But the most important part of it is actually the way that you redesign the memory substrate with the uh, you know with the uh, with the systolic sub arrays that we have broken down and gives you a possibility of co-locating 1 to 16 DNNs at the same time, and it gives you 65 ways that you can break the chip runtime. It's a very fast way of reorganizing the, the application. There's have been follow-on works on this. Uh, I think Berkeley had a paper on how to handle the, you know, the bandwidth uh, when you're uh, dealing with this multi-tenancy. And for the longest time, including our research, uh, you know, itself, looked at neural networks as they were, you know, matrix multiplications. But that actually kind of caused a lot of issues because a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of the research went on to optimizing the matrix engines or gem units, generally is the general matrix multiplication units. But we actually, this year we published a paper, which I think is one of my most important papers, generally speaking, in the whole area of neural processing units and neural acceleration, that neural networks are not matrix multiplication. Actually, the game has changed because for decades, not for decades, for a decade, we just you know focused on accelerating uh, gem units because the argument was that not more than 99% of the operations inside neural networks are actually, uh, uh, you know, matrix, uh, vector matrix multiplication in general. And that was kind of true in the early on, not completely true at the beginning. But as the time progresses, and you can see is that we are seeing more non-gem operations that grow in diversity. 
and they are intertwined with the gem. If you have, you know, gem operations at the beginning and then some non-gem operation at the end, that's not a problem. They are actually intertwined with the gem operation in very complex patterns. So we actually need innovations on non-gem operations that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, that can actually deliver us the performance benefits that we, we need to do to perform end-to-end -end acceleration of the neural networks. And this is another, uh, you know, kind of uh, depiction of the the fact that the uh, the neural networks are saying, and especially in the language models, you'd see much more, uh, you know, different layers that are emerging, and they're just becoming more prevalent. And this is a this shows how these non-gem, the blue is non-gem, and the blue is not water, the blue is non-gem. So is intertwined with the uh, you know matrix units, and there this is a very complex patterns that we have to uh, you know support, and uh, these non-gem units are actually low on data use. They're more uh, you know memory bound bound than compute bound. So and there are two ways that you can address these you know currently in these non-gem operations. One is that you have you know usually if you look at some neural networks, especially early on, uh, there's some pesky units that called sigmoid unit or ReLU unit or something that is thrown at the, you know, architecture, which what that means is that, well, you if you have dedicated units that is dedicated to a specific, uh, you know, layers, then your hardware is becoming deprecated because you can't run the new models. Or you can use a general purpose vector processor. That means that as a unit that is performing your, uh, you know, non-gem operations, but that just didn't, uh, you know, leaves a lot of performance on, you know, on the room and actually creates a bottleneck for your, you know, even your matrix operation. For uh, for this, in that paper, we designed a new SIMD vector processor, which is an, you know, an orthodox SIMD, uh, you know, architecture. It actually doesn't have any register files. It uses block structured loop ISAs, and it actually interleaves scratch paths with ALUs within the, you know, pipeline of the, uh, you know, the SIMD uh, processor. And instead of using instructions to calculate load addresses and then issuing load addresses, it actually sets up hardware iterators at the front of the, uh, you know, on uh, at the front end of the processor that just crunch through, uh, crunches through computation in loops. So you set them up first and then you just crunch through. And it's a little bit of a different model of vector processing because um vector processing you 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 know you load the data even you know GPUs are kind of like that. You load the data, you know, gather it in a register file and then you have parallel units hanging off of the register file that is performing the the you know the the computation in lockstep. In here we're actually interleaving big scratch paths which have like different name uh, namespaces with ALUs that the, the the vector execution is happening in parallel. And because of that we call it recoupled access executor uh, you know architecture. I encourage you to take a look at the paper if you're interested in the details i think this is a very important work uh, that uh, was missing from the literature that we just published so well i'm sure all of you guys are excited about neural networks i am excited about neural networks i've been excited for, you know uh, about neural networks i think since 2004 which they were in a thing at the time but well i am Sorry to break the news, end-to-end -end applications are not just neural networks. I actually dare you to find me an application, real-world application, that the end-to-end -end application itself is just a neural network. Actually, if you look at the continuum, and I'm looking at different you know, workloads, even if you look at a robotics you know, application that uses a speech control, you have <clears throat> to handle signal processing, Yes, you will have neural networks and some neural networks maybe for speech recognition, some neural network for, uh, you know, visual perception. And you need also control on top of, uh, of you know, on top of, uh, you know, these neural networks, that sometimes model predictive control, some, sometimes other kind of control. Actually, robotic applications use a lot of classical, uh, you know, graph algorithms. They have a lot of irregular applications. We're looking at them, uh, you know, right now. It's a, it's actually a very diverse set of kernels that needs to come together to actually carry, a, you know, carry out a kind of a literally some mundane, app, you know, application, generally speaking. Um, 
So that's robotics. If you look at sure. so I'll continue on Thank this. You. No, I sure. Thank you. So and then even if you look at LLMs, one of the most important enterprise applications is actually retrieval augmented generations or RAG. But actually, the most, you know, and we have optimized the execution of the LLM inferencing, at, you know, at SEM. But now, one of the biggest parts that becomes, uh, you know, an issue is the data delivery. This is a slide I borrowed from one of my, you know, collaborators, Professor Muhammad Alian, who, uh, you know, he's in, he just joined Cornell. So, what I'm advocating now is a new paradigm, which is cross domain multi acceleration. And that is, well, when we started this talk, we were talking about general purpose processors, and that was building one hardware to do everything. Then we switched to domain specific architectures, and I you know, went uh, you know, over some of the designs that we have done. And that is designing one, you know, one individual accelerator for each individual domains of uh, you know, algorithmic domains that we are uh, looking at. So there is an open research here, which is something in between that you can actually express multiple algorithmic domains in one programming environment and be able to build compilation stacks that can target multiple accelerators. That's what I call cross-domain expression, multi-acceleration, which is using multiple you know, accelerators at the, at the same time. And there could be heterogeneity in the design of the accelerator or the accelerator itself could be some you know, cross-domain design. Uh, both are possibilities. And the, the, one of the biggest challenges is actually compilation. Actually, compilation even for domain-specific architectures is a humongous challenge, right? And there a lot of startups actually failed because of this issue. And the reason being is that while you build the hardware, you don't have an LLVM that compiles it to, you know, to that hardware. And now if you're moving towards cross-domain multi-acceleration, we now we have to bring together you know, different stacks of compilation that uh, they have their own problems. Uh, and also, I'm going to express my algorithms in different languages or different, like, you know, libraries and things like that. So what we are right now working, and I had a paper in, uh, I think, HPC 2021, that we introduced a cross-domain language, we call it, uh, you know, polymath. But now we have a new, uh, you know, new language, which I'm very happy about it. We call it uh, Phi because of the, you know, uh, fractalized nature of the, the physics, and we're trying to express, uh, you know, physics-based, um, you know, computations, generally speaking, to break these walls and give you a language, a compilation stack that can, you know, support multiple accelerators, multiple algorithmic domains, but do not fall back to the general purpose language. And the components that we are offering is a language, which can be embedded in Python. We have already implemented by, you know, uh, polymath in Python, uh, you know, like, you know, you can use PyTorch in Python. That's a domain specific language. We're talking about cross domain language here in a novel intermediate representation. And then we're offering, you know, pass infrastructures that you can actually go and optimize, uh, you know, the, the, you know, uh, the program itself that you are expressing. And the language is designed based on mathematics. You're actually writing expressions like this ones that you see here that expresses mathematical formulation because not tensor operations. I want to emphasize this. This is a mathematical you know, uh, formulation. Some mathematical formulations work on tensors. Some do not. And we don't actually have for loops. Instead, we have indices, like the same thing in you know, mathematics that you have sigma over i. And that gives us certain benefits in the same in the sense that because I am keeping the algorithmic expression in the mathematical domain, I'm not converting that to a sequential loop that was developed for sequential execution of the general purpose process. And I'm inherently taking advantage of the parallelism that exists in the mathematics without asking the programmer to express any kind of like, you know, parallelism. On top of it, I give you static typing with type qualifiers that allows you, and you're not talking about hardware at all. This is completely hardware agnostic because I'm, I don't even know what kind of hardware I'm gonna, you know, compile the 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 the, the whole thing. We also give you modular programming with subroutines, built-ins, and instead of explicit parallel, you know, programming, you're just actually using mathematical expressions and um, uh, writing mathematics, right? So and. 
for our intermediate representation, we're using a structure. We, we, we have invented something we call a fractalized data flow graph that instead of taking the program and translating it to a granularity of computation, actually it keeps all the granularities of the comp you know, computation intact. And at the same time, you have access to all the granularities of the computation. It's like zooming into a fractal. Each node of an FDFG is also an FDFG until you reach the, the primitives. And you can zoom in and zoom out. And you're going to see different, uh, you know, different computation. This is like, you know, uh, what we are uh, offering. And because you have these different granularities, it gives you an opportunity to actually match the appropriate granularity with the hardware that you know that you're going to have as the accelerator without uh, you know knowing it so that is being actively developed and what we are going after is not only we are trying to target diverse architectures uh you know and let the compiler uh you know control all the parallelism all the you know memory uh, memory management uh, and data movement in the chip but we want to minimize the compiler rewrites. So if you come up with a new architecture, you don't need to go and develop your own comp you know, uh, uh, compiler. And we have gone beyond open sourcing. We even post our design discussions on the, you know, on the website and you can go access uh, the, you know, the Phi program. It's actually the front end is completely done. There is a, a you know, FDFG is also, uh, you know, developed and we're working on the back end compilation at the moment. So another work that we have, just published this year is again about cross-domain multi-acceleration. And is that instead of just like, you know, focusing on uh, compute, we also need to focus on data motion, uh, you know, acceleration generally speaking. What about the data that needs to be handed over between the accelerators? And again, I'm just going to come back to the same point that end-to-end -end application are not just neural network. And even if you look at a video surveillance application that, has a you know a neural network for object detection or like you know event detection you have like three kernels you have to do video decoding you 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 have to do some object detection you have to do data analytics and data analytics not only involves some sort of uh, you know classification but it all, all, all uh, you know all, all, also uh, you know involves database accesses and so if you look at each of these individual kernels that are running so each of them has a specific format Right, the input to a video, uh, you know, decoding uh, is not the same as the input that I can feed a neural network, or whatever I'm coming from out of the neural network is not exactly what I'm, I can read, you know, feed to a database. So there is a code in between these kernels that takes the output of one of these, uh, you know, kernels and converts to the appropriate format and restructures it so that the next kernel can actually perform the computation. And classically, when you were running all these different kernels, uh, you know, on the CPU, or you're just taking one of the kernels and putting it on some accelerator, this data restructuring is not a problem because you're just going to run the previous, you know, kernel on the CPU, perform the data restructuring, and then send the results to the, you know, maybe one accelerator and get back the results, and then you do the post processing. But if you actually take multiple kernels and put them on different accelerators that are connected to you, uh, to your CPU over the interconnect, then you have a humongous overhead of, well, taking the data, passing it through, uh, you know, PCI to uh, PCI Express to the accelerator, then getting it back on the CPU, doing data restructuring, sending back to the next, you know, accelerator that you are performing. So we call this data motion, which is data movement and data uh, restructuring. And the results shows that actually data restructuring, data movement contribute to significant, uh, you know, overhead when it comes to multi-acceleration. That is not, this issue doesn't come up in single acceleration as much. And uh, so then the whole idea is that where do we, what is the compute that, uh, you know, patterns that we need to come up to to, to be able to, uh, you know, deal with this data motion acceleration. And that's the discussions that we, uh, you know, I encourage you to take a look at our DMX paper, data motion acceleration paper uh, <coughs> that, uh, you know, available. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to, you know, jump over some of the details, but the whole idea is that we discuss there what are the different 
ways that you can actually inter inter integrate data restructuring accelerator in you know along with your uh, you know uh, the accelerators that you have and we discussed different uh, trades trade off and I think the best result comes in as a bump in the wire accelerator onto on the system interconnect when i talk about the interconnect here is not i'm not talking about network interface card this is not a smart link this is actually a very small accelerator that augments uh, you know your pci express right i'm just gonna move on the the, the you know that the paper discusses different kernels that have multiple uh, different applications that lend themselves to you know uh, uh multi-acceleration and as one of the other works that we have just published this year again in Asplot is that well again moving to the you know the cloud end of the continuum so how can we do near data heterogeneous acceleration even for cloud servers and the idea is that right now my you know serverless functions is has become a prevalent uh, you know, model of computation. Even California wildfire detection uses, uh, you know, drones to do some wildfire detection, but they they rely on serverless computing. And in the serverless computing, you take the data from the edge, and then you send it to a cloud, uh, you know, the, the cloud, and then you're just calling functions, individual functions, that they, they actually... Uh, you're not renting an infrastructure, you're just calling a function. The data, data center is abstracted as a function. And it takes the data, performs the function, and writes the results in a storage uh, you know, server or a storage uh, unit. And the next function calls and goes the data and then takes it uh, and performs the computation and writes the results in the, you know, in the storage. And what happens is that because you're, you know, you're performing serverless computation, you have to pay a significant amount of overhead for accessing this, uh, you know, storage. And with, with the storage disaggregation, the actually delays that you're going to encounter is actually pretty significant. And now the serverless computing has also been limited to mostly um, CPUs at the, you know, at the moment. And how can we actually utilize hardware accelerators while dealing with the humongous overhead of the storage accelerations. And that is what, uh, you know, what we offer in the, uh, you know, in the paper to deal with this, uh, you know, the overhead of retrieval and storage across uh, multiple serverless function, uh, you know, over uh, invocation that can amount to 55% of the t total, uh, you know, application. And that is by integrating a small accelerator within the storage server, uh, within the storage device, this is actually in a storage domain specific acceleration for service, you know, serverless computing, and um, and again the details you can refer. I, I'm going to refer you to the you know to the paper. But how are we doing this? You know, all these kind of different diverse kinds of research. That's because over the last decade, my research group has uh, invested itself in developing a an entire set, uh, uh, tool set for generating accelerators from high level descriptions. And this is actually open source. And you can, uh, you know, you can generate accelerators from very, uh, you know, from using Python APIs. These are extremely parameterized. It comes with a multi-target compilation, uh, you know, uh, stack you get comprehensive inf uh, you know verification infrastructure and uh, you can actually cover the entire you know entire spectrum you can get ultra low power accelerators from our uh, you know infrastructure high performance access and the reason being is that we actually have developed a template architecture that's highly customizable and it actually integrates the tandem processor that I just described so you can actually run into an uh, you know, applications and we you can run these generated accelerators on your local FPGA or you can even you know we have workflows for using Amazon AWS F1 instances and one in, you know a, an incarnation of these accelerators is actually taped out I'm gonna end this talk and I I was promised I was uh, supposed to end a little bit like you know earlier but I think uh, you know I took a little bit uh, more time. There was a lot of research that I needed uh, to discuss. I'm going to end this talk with this um, beautiful uh, miniature from Maestro Mahmoud Fashion, uh, 
Um, he's one of the biggest maestros of, uh, you know, painting. He's actually here is the fifth day of creation. It's not yet the sixth day. There is a lot to be done. And there's a lot of innovations that we have to, uh, you know, uh, come up with. And uh, I also encourage you to take a look at one of my, you know, kind of uh, theoretical, psychophysical uh, papers on how consciousness can emerge in AIs. This is a uh, philosophical, uh, you know, take on uh, the emergence of co consciousness in, in AI. We lay the groundwork for uh, agents to become conscious, and this is based on social psychology. And our proposition is that the agents can become conscious when they can create a language between themselves that can, they can communicate time varying state changes, internal time varying state changes through the language that they have invented to each other. And that comes with empathy in AI. That is what is kind of missing when it comes to the AI services that we are using and it's causing a lot of harm. Uh, examples of us in social media. So with that, I am happy to take, you know, questions. And thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, uh, have a couple of questions from, from the audience. Uh, first one says, uh, was there a challenge to batch multiple vectors into a, matri into a matrix and fit into the jam unit? Can you repeat the question? I didn't get yeah. the question. Uh, was there a challenge to batch multiple vectors into a matrix and fit into the gem unit? Usually that's like, you know, that's handled by the compiler. So I don't think that becomes a humongous challenge. We have compilers that, you know, I mean, our compiler completely takes care of that. And usually that doesn't become an issue unless you're doing, you, you're doing vector to vector operations that do not necessarily utilize the systolic unit. And that's the, that's more appropriate. I think point-wise convolution is more appropriate for the vector processor. And that's one of the, you know, uh, one of the uh, one of the operators that we actually delegate to the tandem processor. And it's more, much more efficient there uh, because you're doing point-wise convolution. Thank you. Then there is another, uh... Question from our coordinator, Kunde Boucher. And uh, he's asking, do you believe that there is room for analog accelerators? That's a very good, uh, you know, question, Kwan. I mean, I've done, I have, you know, myself, I, I think I was, I came up with the ANPU and it's one of the, it's got 20, the, you know, 50, um, uh, 25 rest respectives. I have mixed feelings about that. I know there is a lot of, uh, you know, research that gets published in ISSC and JSSC. And then what they do is that they take one neural network and map it in an analog substrate, and then you get humongous, you know, gains. But then the problem is that what are you going to do with that analog unit? Is it is it programmable or not? There is a programmability issue that exists, uh, you know, when it comes to the analog. And also we have optimized the digital technology when it comes to silicon. To this, that it's really hard to beat the, the you know the benefits that you're getting from the you know dig digital even with analog. My realistic measurements that we have done is far from what I see in other papers. We just see around two to three x improvement when you switch to the analog compared to very optimized digital execution. And for me, that doesn't necessarily justify you know changing the technology. If I wanted to be more optimistic, uh, there are two ways that I can be more optimistic about, uh, you know, analog. One is that maybe some sort of in-memory analog acceleration, if programmability is actually, uh, is a first grade, uh, you know, objective in designing on uh, there. And somehow some, you know, applications exist that you can, deal with the non-determinism execution and you can convince the you know the the machine learning experts that you know it's going to work out there might be a room for that uh, i don't see it in critical applications to be available and i'm hearing some uh, you know uh, some some things about the uh, you know kind of sparse computational pulse based neural networks not in the scale that was advertised with the uh, true north 
but for very small scale insect, you know, great intelligence for certain applications that nobody should be talking about, that could be a way for analog. But I'm not as optimistic about analog at the moment. I haven't seen for programmability issues and the gains when it's you add the programmability are not thousands. It's actually two to three X in the same order of magnitude. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think we should uh, uh, stop here because it's, we are up to the hour and people will start disappearing. Thanks again to our speaker, Hadi. Uh, Thank Great you. talk. So for and uh, then I would like to remind uh, all our attendees that we have a call for research exchanges to uh, European researchers to visit uh, US uh, researchers and that you can find the information in our website. Uh, if you can, if you look at the chat, I have uh, written there the, the, the address. And uh, with this, I would like to... to, to uh, to finish this session. Thank you very much. Thank Maria, you, you put, did you to add anything else? No, no, just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a thank good you. Bye-bye.